video games have come on hard times these days with closeout sales, discount prices just about everywhere. But what about computer games? Well, as computers have gotten better, computer games have gotten better too, with vastly improved graphics, much more sophisticated text handling, and much greater speed. We'll take a look at some of the newest and hottest computer games next on the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing, the magazine that gives readers an understanding of the technology and applications of microcomputers and software in office, home, and classroom. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. This is Gary Kildall. And the subject, obviously, is games, Gary. And I'll bet you've seen some pretty swift computer chess games before, but I want to show you this one. This game not only has good computer logic in it, but as you can see, it moves the pieces all by itself, mm -hmm. can even play both sides if it wants to all by itself. Computer games kind of drove the early personal computer revolution, and some people are saying that computer games as a part of the market is kind of dying now. Do you think that's the case? Well, it looks from the, this game that the game player is a dying breed, but... <laughs> play, they don't, you don't need us, to, do they? <laughs> don't even need to be here to play it. But, uh, no, Stuart, I think what's happened is the market has settled down to a group of dedicated game players, and those game players expect uh, fairly sophisticated video games. Well, we're going to see some pretty sophisticated games. We're going to meet the premier chess programmer, Kathy Sprecklin of Sargon. We'll meet one of the hottest new games, Millionaire. We'll go into the mysteries of the new adventure games. And you know, the graphics demands of new computer games are so great that programmers are now turning to the animators who used to work for Disney. We have a report. The art of animation grew up alongside the early motion picture industry. Based on storyboards, character development, and a detailed script, it was a repetitive and time-consuming process. But today, much of the task can be computer-assisted, and that has great potential for the computer game field. This game designer can dream up a character, give him a personality, lifelike moves, and quickly bring his paper sketches to life on the screen. With a light pen, an artist can adjust each pixel on the screen to give his character the most fluid movements. All of the elements of the game, from action to background, can be drawn on a graphics pad, tested, and changed instantly. To create an explosion, the animator first determines the shape and the size of the blast, and then builds a sequence. After checking the result, he can place it precisely within the scene. But in spite of electronic aids, the present-day game designer is still faced with a monumental challenge to transfer the personality of an invented character from the full-size drawing pad to the tiny pixels on a video screen. To accomplish this takes finesse and detail. For example, when the hero is introduced, his movements are quick and bold. But when faced with adversity, his mood reflects it, and he slinks away with slumping shoulders. To most players, this may not seem like a major step forward, but it closely resembles the methods used to make traditional animation lifelike. The more plastic and fluid the movement, the more realistic the action. How much of this realism can be transferred to the electronic game board remains to be seen. I'd like to introduce you now to Kathy Sprecklin, the writer of Sargon, and Jim Zuber of Blue Chip Software, creators of Millionaire. Gary. Kathy, you know, uh, one of the amazing things about uh, chess games is it seems like it was 15 or 20 years ago that uh, chess programming on a big computer system was a major research mm -hmm. topic. And then one day I walked into Macy's and saw a little chess program and a tiny little board. What happened to cause that to take place anyway? Obviously, the microcomputer revolution, the existence of a single chip computer. I guess it's like um, if a new mountain sprung up in the world, all the mountain climbers would rush to it. And there's a new processor out there. You've got to see what it's capable of doing. But is it, is it, it, it seems like it's, uh, it's, it's, there's a lot of uh, work or, or a lot of programming would have to go into just all of the strategies that would take, take place inside of a, a chess game. What is the basic uh, way that you construct a chess program? Okay, um, yes, there is a lot of work that goes on to it. What you have to do, like any big project, you have to break it down into manageable steps. And we divide it up into move generation, 
how do you get the machine to understand what is a pawn move, what is a queen move? Uh, then you have to have evaluation. Now that you can make moves, which moves are good moves, which moves are bad moves? And uh, once you've, that gets you into the whole concept of search, look ahead, which is another whole topic. How can you make it as fast as possible so you can see as far ahead as possible? And then there's another whole brain, uh, realm which has to do with graphics displays and user features and how do you let the human being get into the program as much okay, as possible. Okay, in the case of the Mac, now you've, you've got a, a very graphical interface, obviously. Mm -hmm. Uh, was that quite a change in the... In the <laughs> oh, it was, but it was delightful, you mm -hmm. know. It was like presenting the, a kid with a mountainous ice cream sundae. It was everything you ever wanted and a computer mm -hmm. never had before uh, between the... the well, show us how you used the Mac, in fact, to, to augment Sargon. Okay. Well, the first thing, the most obvious thing, is how do you make your moves on the computer? When we were dealing with... Um, older generation machines, you had to type in coordinates that represented the squares of the board, like E2, E4 for a pawn move. Now you simply take this little cursor that looks like a crosshair, position it over the piece that you want to move, press, let it go where you want to move it. And Sargon responds by flashing his move. And it actually does record the coded move. Yes, if you. you still want to see the move list, you can get it recorded there. If you like, you can print it. There's a file. Um, you can print the move list if you want to do that. All of the features that are... I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> well, it certainly makes it a, a lot, <laughs> a lot uh, simpler to use and a lot easier to see what's going on in the other yeah. games. Have. All the features you mm -hmm. can get at just with the press of a mouse button. In fact, it's aside from naming your game, that's the only time you'd ever need to touch the keyboard. So how, does this, how does a game like this uh, uh, fare in, in terms of uh, being uh, playing a good chess player? Does it do well? Um, it beats... Um, it beats the, uh, the majority of tournament chess players, and it just absolutely the vast majority of casual chess players. Hmm. Um, a world champion would have no difficulty beating it whatsoever. A chess master could probably play it a um, hundred games in a row, and it might surprise it and win one game or something. That it no. might, the master might win can, all Can 100. you win the game pretty well because you know all the, the corners? <laughs> <laughs> I have to set it on its lowest level. You can set levels based on time. If I put it on five seconds move, and if I select this little thing called easy play, <laughs> then I can beat it. <laughs> Kathy, you went from Sargon to Sargon 2 to Sargon 3. What were the improvements? How is it a better chess game now? Each uh, edition of Sargon involved a total rewrite of the chess playing algorithm. Each version of the program had approximately a times 10 or better speed improvement, which translates directly to a play enhancement. The big thing that a user of Sargon 2 would notice compared to Sargon 3, Sargon 2 played a fine game of chess if you were patient. If you were mm -hmm. willing to wait two or three minutes a move, you got a fine game of chess. Sargon 3 gives you that same game of chess at five or ten seconds a move. And I understand that this is a husband-wife team. That's right. <laughs> as far as programming is concerned. That's great. Jim, I want to get you in here, and you're not the husband. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but you've got Millionaire, which also is especially tailored to take advantage of some of the Mac features. So introduce us to Millionaire. Well, basically, Millionaire is a stock market simulation. And uh, as I was mentioning before we went on, uh, the way I got into this was I'd made a few thousand dollars doing some consulting work and invested it in stock options. And over the course of a year, had a great time. Learned an awful lot about stock options and also lost half the money. <laughs> um, just about that time, the IBM personal computer was coming on the market, and there was great speculation over the kind of person that would buy that computer, an upwardsly mobile person very concerned about their own personal well-being and their personal net worth. And uh, I decided that, gee, why don't I take the experiences that I just learned in the stock market and apply it to a computer game that kind of specifically tailored to the kind of individual that would buy the IBM personal computer. Tell us how, in using Mac, you were able to make Millionaire such an effective game. Okay. Basically, the, the original version of Millionaire on the IBM was structured in a kind of a hierarchy of menus, which is, pretty, is a pretty traditional way to write a, a computer program. And unfortunately, in the real world, when you want to invest in the stock market, you want to look at all kinds of information at the same time. And about six months before the Mac came out, Apple came to us and said, gee, we'd like to make sure that uh, Millionaire is available on the Macintosh. And we were very ex excited about it. And as a coincidence, two days after Apple came to us, I got a call from a programmer that had spent the past year programming the Macintosh for Pete Marwick Mitchell. So suddenly, so, two days, we had a programmer with a year's experience and uh, a product, and we were ready to go.
Okay, um, show us how you'd, uh, you'd play this here. First thing we're going to do is we're going to bring up a save, a, a save game, and in about 10 seconds you'll see the, uh, the central screen of Millionaire. Basically, you can invest in 15 stocks, in five industry groups, and everything you can do in the real world, you can do in Millionaire. Does this and make you a better, a better investor? Too? It will not make you rich. <laughs> uh, we, we bang away at, the, at that time and time again. The feedback we get from our customers is, is they say, my gosh, the stupid mistakes that I didn't make because I played your game first. Millionaire provides you with that fundamental knowledge that gives you the courage to go out and invest. Okay, Jim, just a little time left. We have the basic okay. screen up here. Show we us have how the you basic play. screen up here. Basically, here's how you play a game of Millionaire. I'd say, gee, let's buy some Dow Jones stock. I'd click on Dow. We'd come over here, get a description of Dow Jones. Tell us, learn a little bit about the history of the company. Gee, what's it all about? Next thing we do. And this is, is based on fact, all this. Based on fact. We'd come and take a look at how the stock market in general is performing. Stock market looks like it's going up. We take a look at how the heavy industry group's doing. Seems to be going up. Let's take a look at Dow Chemical. Ah, Dow's going up. Let's go ahead and buy a little bit of Dow Chemical. And we're going to slip the keyboard over here. Now well, let's go ahead and buy 3,000 shares of, of Dow Chemical. And as you'll notice, we'll get a transaction report just like you'd get from your broker. Commission and the whole and the whole works. Now we're going to move over and we're going to clean up the desktop a little bit as soon as the computer will allow me to do that. Now what we're going to do next is we're going to move ahead a week and we're going to see, gee, what happens when we move ahead a week to the price of our stock? Before we do so that... how'd you do in the first week? Is how do we do asking. in the first mm -hmm. week? And this is the beauty of Millionaire. What I can do is I can bring down my stock portfolio. I can shrink it up a little bit. Okay. I can bring down a graph of the stock price. Ah, let's get the graph. And I can scroll the graph. Horizontal scrolling. We can shrink it up something like this. How well, about that? We'll move it over here. Now we'll bring down news reports. The game actually has newspaper reports from the Wall Street Journal and Barron's. <laughs> and Jim, as you go forward each week, you'll see news reports. This really shows the power of the, the, the graphical interface. The Macintosh the is a very, very powerful <laughs> computer. Now what we'll do... I'm going to have okay. to interrupt you, Jim, because okay. you don't have time to okay. see the rest of it. As tempting okay. as all that is. Oh, actually, goodness. some of the hot games this year are, of course, the adventure games, and we're going to take a look at two of the most impressive adventure games in just a moment. Joining us now is David Crane, a software designer, one of the original founders of Activision, writer of Pitfall and now Ghostbusters, and also David Lebling, a game designer with Infocom and a co-author of the Zork series. Now, before we get to play Zork and take a look at Ghostbusters, the program, you're probably familiar with other movies like Star Wars and Raiders, which had spectacular special effects. Well, some of that same technology is being adapted now for computer games by director George Lucas. Wendy Woods has a report. Welcome to Lucasfilm. For the sake of security, we can't tell you exactly where we are, but I can tell you that this is where programmers have virtually free hands in employing state-of-the-art technology in video game design. Rescue on Fractalus is one of the first two games from the movie company. The player sees his or her point of view and a world where space, form, mass, and velocity are true to life. This is accomplished in part by use of a geometrical formula called the fractal. And what the fractals do is it takes the altitude at various points on the terrain and then it uses a repeatable technique for randomly generating the cragginess or, or rocky edges that, that connect these points of altitude. Artist Gary Winnick designed the amusing and surprising creatures in the game. Ball Blazer is a kind of space-age hockey with two players' points of view. You'll notice the edges on the playing field diagonals are smooth. That's called anti-aliasing, or blending five different colors at certain grid points. Lucasfilm designers took a year to complete both these games. Uh, we didn't have a marketing organization breathing down our necks saying, you have to get this done in three weeks or something. And rather than worrying about that part, we were just told, do the best you can do, do something which is new, which really um, pushes the art of video games and video technology as far as you can make it. The designer's next games will be for the newest low-end computers. You can be sure the entire industry will be watching. 
For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. Well, Stuart, before we get into uh, another movie here, Ghostbusters, <laughs> it looks real interesting. I'm, I'm anxious to see what this looks like. I'd like to uh, talk, David, a little bit about adventure games. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is an adventure game and what makes it so uh, interesting for people? It's a, in a world right now where we're going to graphics a lot, it seems to be basic, based in words. And uh, what is it? Well, the wonderful thing about an adventure game that's based on words, of course, is that your brain probably can do a much better job of creating the pictures than the computer can with today's technology. And so our games are all text. You interact with the computer in words, and the computer spits words back out at you. And so there are no pictures at all, except the ones in your head, which are the mm -hmm. best. Now, uh, uh, these are the kind of games that, uh, well, mostly, I guess, kids play with. And, and they, they go through a, a different branching uh, schemes. And every, every point, you get a chance to go north, south, east, and west, and so forth. Are, are, these, are these games getting more sophisticated now? Who's writing them? Are they being written by authors? Or what? They're definitely getting more sophisticated. And I wouldn't even say that they're mostly played by children mm -hmm. anymore. Um, mm -hmm. We have people from ages 8 on up. As soon as you can understand the words, you can play mm -hmm. it. And it doesn't necessarily fade with age. A lot of adults enjoy them quite a bit. And I guess what I'd say about the idea of branching is that it's more than just branching because it would be a very, very fuzzy mm -hmm. branching thing if it was a branch. It's got directions, it's got verbs, and the verbs can be very complicated. You can say things like uh, things with direct objects and indirect objects. You can talk to other characters. You can ask fairly complicated questions like, uh, where were you on the night of the murder? And so it's more than just a simple branching scheme. Mm -hmm. It's a really fairly complicated uh, computer program. Mm -hmm. Now, David, to confirm what you said about uh, age, by the way, I'm a great Zork fan <laughs> and into all your <laughs> other stuff, unfortunately. But I remember playing the old Scott Adams adventure game, mm -hmm. you know, go north, you know, right. drop box, you know. And it's, gone, it's come such a long way now to the Zork type things and what's come after that. What has allowed that difference? I mean, how did it get so much better? Well, one reason it got better, I think, is that uh, Infocom, at least, has an extremely good development system and an extremely good parser built into the into the program and the parser can understand very complex sentences and the more complex the sentence you can understand the more complicated and more exciting the action in the game can be okay david crane let's turn to the other <laughs> side now of, of games here from an adventure game with no graphics to your kind of thing which is loaded with graphics first of all of course you were most well known for pitfall i guess which was a video game uh, cartridge type thing primarily uh, do you think computer games are kind of going to go the way of video games, or is this a different animal that interest in them won't die? Well, um, there are going to be several different classifications of games going forward, um, such as uh, adventure games, there are strategy games, action games, arcade games. One of the most difficult uh, aspects of the industry right now is categorizing games because everything crosses into other categories. Uh, Ghostbusters, as a computer game, is an action game, but unlike action games in the past, which took place on one screen, one pretty picture, um, there are so many different aspects to the game. In this game, you're starting a franchise with, with bank money and um, several different screens where you plot courses through the city streets and you drive through the city streets, and once you get there, you have to catch the ghosts. If you miss, they can slime you. It's on and on and on. <laughs> Can, and we, can we see in here yeah. some of Ghostbusters? Okay. Well, to begin with... Ghostbusters! <laughs> the game begins with a, um, a screen which has no playability. Uh, it's a title page, and if you watch for a little bit, we'll find a little bouncing ball comes along the screen, and you can sing along with the, with the game. If you don't feel like singing along, or if you don't have a crowd in your living room to yell Ghostbusters at the appropriate time, the machine will do that for you. Ghostbusters! <laughs> okay. When you hit the space bar. When you hit the space bar. <laughs> now, I understand it took you as long to write this opening frame as it did the rest of the game. Is that true? No, that's not really true. Um, it's something that I wanted to have in the game. And I didn't do it until the last week, actually, of the project, because I, it's more important to me that the game plays correctly and that all the details are in it. But something like this is an added feature that I like to provide to the consumer. Nice attraction. <laughs> now, David, let, let me ask you, uh, computer games have been very innovative in the Zork-type things and, and Pitfall. Uh, uh, computer games have kind of led the way. 
Does it concern you that we're now kind of repackaging movies? I mean, has the game business now gotten to the movie business and the pop music business? Um, not in my opinion. Um, it's been attempted many times before to make games out of movies and any kind of merchandising you can name. In fact, this game uh, began before the movie Ghostbusters as a game of um, in a very similar fashion of driving through the city streets, doing something once you get to the building, etc. But it was a game which was looking for a theme at the time. Mm -hmm. And when Activision and Columbia Pictures got together, I saw this as an opportunity to lend a theme to a game. But it's, it's a game that people have told me they would enjoy playing whether there was a Ghostbusters name on it or not. Right, so You're just kind of attractive because the uh, because of the connection. Can we go a little bit further with it and see what uh, <laughs> <laughs> you want to play I'll this? I can tell. Oh. See this. <laughs> so okay. We screen. <laughs> so what are we doing? Well, I have just told her that I don't have an account number. Um, if I had an account number, I could start with the same amount of money I ended the game with last time, which is a nice feature. Allows you to build upon your account. And, um, but once I have uh, bought my Ghostbusters franchise with bank money, I'm going to have to uh, have some equipment to work with. So I buy a car and begin to equip it with my <laughs> this, little forklift. This forklet. comes out of, out of your capital. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> buy a little ghost bait, you know, a ghost mm -hmm. vacuum. These are basically are useful. comic items because the game was a comedy. Uh, but you do have to have this equipment to play the game. Now, once I have a fully equipped car, I look at the city map screen. I have uh, Ghostbusters headquarters right below me and the Temple of Zul in the middle of the screen. But I see a flashing block which says there is there's a ghost to catch. Right? We've got a job to do here. Right? Now I'm able to drive. Made movie, right? <laughs> I'm able to drive through the city streets. This will come in handy later as I suck up roaming ghosts in my ghost vacuum. But here's my Slimer, so I must set down a trap. Take one man and point his streamer. Another man here. When the ghost is between the streams, I'll catch him. Uh, you got, him. got him. Okay. Energize the trap. <laughs> My men jump up and down for joy, and the crowd yells. <laughs> okay, that's great. We, we have just a little that's bit good. of time left. Uh, David Le Leveling, briefly, what do you see as the next challenge in, in adventure games on that end? I think the next. You can turn the sound down, dude. I Thanks. think the next challenge is probably more sophistication. Moving away from the straight puzzle solving, you know, you have to get this there, or you have to do that, and into something that is a little more sophisticated, something that can do a real plot of a real novel. What we have now is sort of a short story kind of a form, and more sophistication will come mm -hmm. as we have more sophisticated parsers and programs to do it with. Well, I'm looking forward to more adventure games and certainly playing Ghostbusters. Now, computer games, and I guess adventure games in particular, are not only a computer phenomenon, they're almost a social phenomenon. Our commentator, Paul Schindler, has some thoughts on that. I'm playing Candyland with my daughter. It's a good game for improving her color identification and her verbal skills. It's a nice way to while away the time, and I'm using it to teach her not to cheat. How many computer games can make statements like that? Now, listen, I know computer games have the good side. I've reviewed some in the software segment, and I'm going to review more in the future. But in today's commentary, I want to ask you to consider the social effects of replacing other kinds of games with computer games. Now, let me give you an example. I cover conventions in Las Vegas a couple of times a year, and I play blackjack when I'm there. You can play it with a computer, or you can play it with people. Now, not surprisingly, I prefer to play it with people. You get more interaction, you learn more about the game. It's going to be a long time before computers can offer us that kind of interaction. Well. You may say, board games don't offer as much interaction as playing, and that's true. But before we take the next step to even less interaction with computer games, I just think we ought to consider what we're doing. Because you're going to lose more than just a rocket ship on the screen. You're going to lose human interaction. That's my opinion. I'm Paul Schindler.
Random Access file this week. Lots of news on the lap portable front. First of all, Grid Systems, known as the Porsche of lap portables, has come up with a whole new line of lap portables starting at about half the price of the original Grid Compass. An interesting aspect of the new Grid lineup is that you can pick the kind of screen you want depending on your interest in readability versus power consumption. The new Grid machines go from traditional hard-to-read LCD screens all the way up to a new plasma display with red characters on a black background. Meanwhile, Ericsson Computers is out with a new plasma display portable. It weighs in, though, at 15 pounds. And K Pro has introduced its new lap portable. It features a 25-line LCD display, IBM compatibility, and a built-in microfloppy. And the Morrow Pivot is taking its crack at a readable LCD screen with a portable featuring a kind of backlit LCD display which glows in the dark. One of the problems with the old portables, the luggables, was you could break your back carrying them. Well, the good news is there is now software that analyzes back problems. It's called the Spinal Health Data Program, and it uses an IBM PC to digitize back x-rays into high-resolution color graphics, which supposedly provide provide better information to the doctor on what's wrong. The computer also compares the profile of the x-ray to a standard normal spinal configuration and offers diagnostic help. The idea of a robot with eyes has moved one step farther along with the development of a new line of vision robots from a company called Defracto. Using solid-state video cameras, strobe lighting, and computerized wraparound lasers, the robots can not only see as well as humans, but can poke their robot eyes into tiny openings, see behind things, and see with a precision and speed impossible for the human eye. One of Defracto's new seeing-eye robots can sort objects at the rate of 10,000 an hour and can spot and reject microscopic imperfections. That much-dreaded phrase, our computer is down, may be a thing of the past. If Tandem Computers has its way, Tandem, makers of so-called no-fault or fully redundant computers, has unveiled a new line of low-cost, fail-safe minis which can run in a normal office environment. The no-fault machines are popular with banks and airlines, where downed computers can be costly, if not disastrous. One disaster you want to avoid is buying the wrong software, so here's Paul again with this week's review. Oh, I was just checking my armband here. You know, we were all looking forward to the reading of the will until we found out there wasn't one. A lot of people don't leave wills, usually because it's too expensive. Many states now allow stationery stores to sell form wills. This looks like a clear opportunity for computerization. At least that's what the San Francisco PC Users Group thought when they distributed free will. Now, this is an all-text program, and frankly, it isn't terribly sophisticated. On the other hand, it beats the heck out of having to type all this in by yourself. This is as much a review of Free Will's distribution as of the package itself. We got it for $6 through a users group. There's lots of good software at users groups. They, in turn, got it from Headlands Press in Tiburon, California, where the tireless Andrew Flugelman pushes his concept of freeware, software you pay for voluntarily. So users of Free Will, who like it, sent another $10 to a company called C2 in Soquel, California. This is the opposite of copy protection. Freeware invites you to copy their software. I like that idea. Hats off to the Headlands Press in Tiburon. Tiburon. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. General Motors has announced that the 1986 Buick Riviera will come with a full onboard computer featuring a touch-sensitive CRT display on the dash. The computer will oversee nearly 100 automobile functions. If you're into walking rather than driving, you might be interested in a new company called Amfit, which uses a computerized system to put shoes on your feet. Amfit has a new process for programming its insole cutting machine by placing your foot in a pneumatic pressure bed while 500 little dowels form around your foot and tell the milling machine exactly how to shape your shoes. Finally, is the end of QWERTY at hand? What is QWERTY? The old-fashioned layout of typewriters, and some say, unfortunately, computer keyboards. The QWERTY layout was originally designed to slow down touch typists in the 30s when the fingers could move faster than the keys. But with today's computers, speed of keys is not the issue, so advocates of the Dvorak keyboard with a more practical layout of the letters say the time is ripe to bid farewell to QWERTY and say hello Dvorak. The Dvorak proponents say the new layout speeds up typing and therefore computer input by 50%, but with 30 million QWERTY keyboards out there, the process Prospects for quick change and quicker typing are dim. That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles was brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing, the magazine that gives readers an understanding of the technology and applications of microcomputers and software in office, home, and classroom.